Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the urology students joined from all over the world for our urology exam preparations. We are doing episode 61 with mock exam episode 11. Today we are going to discuss some scenarios in relation to female urology and functional neurourology. We have our first trainee. Welcome. Happy to start? Yes, I'm happy to start. Your time starts now. You have a 40-year-old lady presents with history of urinary incontinence. How are you going to evaluate her? Uh, I'll review this uh, lady in my female dedicated female urology clinic in the presence of my continence nurse specialist. Ideally, with the results of her uh, uh, uroflometry post-void rescue, uh, three-day bladder diary, ICIQ FLAT score, uh, urine dip, uh, and the results for observation and body mass index. Uh, I'll go on to take further details about her incontinence, including whether it's urge, uh, stress, or mixed incontinence. Uh, other red flag symptoms, such as hematuria, pain abdomen, uh, history of constipation, any neurological symptoms, any relevant past medical history with current medications, past neurological interventions, prior surgeries, any prior cancers and uh, uh, related uh, pelvic radiation that she may have received, um, uh, any uh, prior pregnancies and birth weight of her children, uh, and any uh, intervent any uh, instrumented deliveries that she may have had, uh, <clears throat> uh, diet and uh, fluid intake, including caffeine, uh, history of smoking, um, and any other illicit drug use. Uh, I'll then proceed to um, uh, assess her, examine her in the presence of a chaperone after taking verbal consent and ensuring privacy. Uh, I'll do a general examination first where I'll complete my assessment of ASN performance status. I'll then proceed to uh, examination of her abdomen where I'm specifically looking for a palpable bladder, suprapubic tenderness, a flank tenderness. Uh, then I'll uh, do a pervaginal examination after consenting uh, her. Uh, <clears throat> where I'll, I'm specifically looking for any stress leak on Valsalva maneuver. Uh, I'll check for prolapse. I'll check for cystocele and vectocele using a SIM speculum. I'll check for degree of estrogenization. Uh, uh, yes, this this will complete my uh, examination and history. And depending upon what information I've gathered till now, I'll guide my further management. Okay, the major findings in the history are uh, she didn't fill her bladder diary yet and um, she had past history of four children born by normal vaginal delivery. All the four children were of normal weight. No history of any instrument usage during the labor. Examination is uh, non conclusive of anything and her vagina is nicely estrogenized. There is no signs of any prolapse. Uh, so, uh, since she's uh, 40, uh, I'll, uh, in my history, I would have uh, found out whether sh she has uh, urgency or stress or mixed incontinence, uh, because that will be quite uh, a key in, in guiding my, my um, further management. I would like to know if she had more of urge, stress or mixed. It's more of um, urge incontinence. So, uh, and, and, sorry, urge... and, sorry, it's a mixed incontinence, both the uh -huh. urge incontinence okay. and stress incontinence. Okay. So, since she has uh, mixed incontinence, I'll again uh, request her to fill a bladder diary. Uh, but at, I won't be waiting for the results of that. I'll go ahead and uh, uh, check her uh, fluid and uh, caffeine intake anyways. Uh, my general advice to her would be to reduce her fluid intake to around 2 liters per day. I'll ask her to cut down on her caffeine intake and switch to decaf if she is taking a lot of cups of tea. Um, <clears throat> I'll also uh, guide her to start some pelvic uh, tra uh, pelvic uh, flow muscle exercises, which has to be supervised, bladder retraining. I'll ask her to uh, try to lose some weight and guide her to her GP for any uh, weight loss programs if they have one. Uh, and uh, yes, the... Uh, these are the general measures that I'll, I'll advise to her. I'll also advise her to stop smoking if she's having any habits of smoking. Okay, how will you teach her pelvic floor exercise? So, uh, <clears throat> pelvic floor exercises, uh, uh, in our center, we have a dedicated physiotherapist who does this, but uh, what I what it generally involves is uh, she, that she needs to uh, try to contract her pelvic muscles, with which I can guide her by uh, doing a per rectal examination, wherein I'll... Uh, make sure that she's doing it correctly and she has to hold it in contracted position and also include some sharp pull-ups 
uh, and do this many times in the day. Uh, but uh, this has to be supervised by a, a dedicated physiotherapist, ideally. What is the mechanism? How it works? So uh, the theory here is that pelvic floor muscle uh, uh, exercises will help in, uh, in 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 increasing the strength of the pel uh, the uh, uh, pelvic floor muscles. Uh, during my examination, I would have done an Oxford uh, grading to see the tone of a vagina, which actually helps me guide uh, about how good her tone of the how good the pelvic floor muscle tone is. And as this tone increases, then uh, the incidence of stress incontinence is going to decrease. Um, uh, so uh, basically, the theory here is that uh, uh, there, there are many theories of stress and incontinence, um, and one of them is uh, is that the anterior vaginal wall gets laxed, the puborethral ligaments get laxed, and the pelvic uh, diaphragm, uh, which holds the bladder neck in position, that gets laxed. Uh, so these are the muscles that can get strengthened, and uh, this can help prevent stress incontinence. What is the Oxford muscle grading system? Uh, so the Oxford muscle grading system, uh, it it, uh, it basically involves me. Uh, it is done during the pervaginal examination, asking the, uh, the uh, lady to uh, contract her pelvic floor muscles. Uh, it is graded from zero, uh, and, and then, of course, zero is no contraction. One is slight contraction. Two is uh, full motion against gravity. Uh, three is full motion of overcoming gravity. Four is full motion against light resistance. And five is full motion against strong resistance. Okay. Or um, in case of the bladder diary, uh, what are all the features you want to know from our bladder diary? So uh, the features that I'm looking for here are the maximum bladder capacity, uh, uh, the type of fluid that she's drinking um, in terms of tea, coffee, or caffeinated drinks, uh, fizzy drinks, uh, any bladder irritants. Uh, then I'm looking for the for the amount of nocturia that she's having. Uh, I'm also looking for the number of times she's having to go to uh, pass urine and any episodes of incontinence that she's needing, any uh, pads that she has to use uh, and the number of pads that she has to use. Okay, her bladder diary shows a functional bladder capacity of 450 ml. She has a frequency of say five times in the day and maybe one in the night, not much. Few days there are no nighttime frequency. She is using pads because of stress urinary incontinence and uh, her usage is four pads on most of the days. Uh, four pads. So uh, I'll again uh, discuss uh, um, the, 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 uh, her symptoms with her because from frequency of five times in the day and once in the night, it is quite possible that, the, that she has more of stress rather than urge incontinence, but I will discuss, I'll, I'll try to go deep into the history of this again. Um, so uh, yes, so th once I have this in, in in mind, and then I can uh, continue her on the conservative management, and see see her in, in around six weeks, and then see how she's responding to this, and then guide my further management. Okay, as a part of conservative management, she's trying to get some shed some weight and change to decaffeinated drinks, avoid constipation, appropriate hydration. But she still says that whenever she strains or climbs up the staircase, she has urine leakage. So um, I'll try to see if there's any improvement. Uh, there are, I'll explain to her that definitely there are further treatment options that we can offer. Now, in terms of further treatment options, looking at stress incontinence, uh, there is pharmacotherapy, but I will explain to her that... Uh, uh, there's a drug called as duloxetine, but it's not licensed for this particular use yet. Uh, there are other options, including minimally invasive options and uh, uh, surgical options. Minimally invasive options would in include uh, urethral bulking with polyacrylamide, or 2.5% uh, and 97.5% water. I'll explain to her that the efficacy of this is uh, lower compared to surgery, and it has to be repeated on multiple occasions. Uh, I'll explain to her the surgical options, uh, which are the Birch Colp suspension uh, and autologous facial slings. Uh, I'll explain to her that earlier we used to do meshes, but now uh, this has been uh, stopped as per NICE guidelines due to some quality concerns. I'll also explain her some literature uh, between the efficacy of these trials. I'll tell her about this, about the findings of the sister trial, uh, which said that uh, Birch Colp suspension in the long term is slightly inferior to uh, autologous facial slings. Uh, but I will explain her that uh, according to the UK TBT group, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, the efficacy of uh, TBT 
and TOT is, is equal to Birch Kolper suspension. I'll explain how the procedures that are, that are done and then we can make an informed decision. Tell me more about duloxetine. What is duloxetine? What are the side effects? Why it is not commonly used? So duloxetine is a, is a combined serotonin uh, and norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. It works at the onus nucleus and increases the, the tone of the pudendal nerve, thereby increasing the urethral uh, tone and thus helping in stress incontinence. The problem is that its efficacy is not that good. It's around 25 to 40%. And it has significant side effects, including uh, okay. dry mouth, dyspepsia, uh, and, and this is why it's not used uh, commonly. Okay, good. And uh, we'll stop here. And duloxetine also has like new mood instability, even okay. going up to the suicidal tendencies. The suicidal tendencies. Yeah, yes, that's that's much more important because um, yes. the other side effects we can manage and uh, we can stop, we can revise. But suicidal tendencies are quite irreversible, and if some catastrophe happens, um, yes. it's very difficult. So try to mention that. Maybe I think the bell rang and uh, you may not be in a position to complete the answer right yeah good good presentation i have no major concerns uh, in fact i should not have any major concerns for any of you from now onwards uh, right. just minor things here and there like for example having a body weight uh, before you saw, see the patient uh, that you didn't mention but in the uh, life Lifestyle changes, you said you will try to reduce the body weight. I, I said actually that observations and body mass index. Body mass index. Before okay. I, they come in. Okay, good. So urine tape observations like height and weight and calculated body mass index. That's good. Yeah. Uh, examination wise is fine. Um, I think the flow is good. The, your logical thinking is good. Um, exam sometime you will get a pure stationary incontinence, which is much more straightforward. But there are some scenarios with mixed incontinence but slightly leaning towards one or the other. So in right. this scenario, you can see it's a mixed urinary incontinence, but leaning more towards stress urinary incontinence. Stress. And uh, similarly, there may be the other way also, mixed urinary incontinence leaning more towards urge urinary incontinence. Um, I will say since there is a, a, a part of urge incontinence noted, Nothing wrong in trying um, anticholinergics or okay. uh, beta-3 okay. agonist. Uh, I mean, uh, I won't say that that is the first line of treatment. I will send her with three months and then review. Not like that. But you can say like, since there is a small component of urge incontinence, I will explain okay. to her there is a role for anticholinergics. I will explain yeah. her that anticholinergics and beta-3 agonist will not answer the stress urinary incontinence part, but okay. there is nothing wrong in giving a try. Okay. Right. Right. Because you right. have decided almost to give a three months of conservative management of just hydration, yeah. weight reduction, treating constipation, decap drinks, which is good. But um, I think adding anticholinergics or mirabegron at the time uh, is not going to do any harm. Maybe patient may okay. feel some improvement because your next okay. stop is more of operative interventions, isn't it? Right. Yes, 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 um, Mr. Danshu. Yeah. If it is a pure stressing in incontinence, I agree with you. Don't bring any medications okay. and uh, you can even bring it just for the sake of discussion because practically we okay. do, practically we do give some medicines before yeah. doing anything. And one thing we haven't had the time to touch is the role of urodynamics. Obviously, I think you will certainly say if it is a pure stress urinary incontinence, there is no role for urodynamics as per the NICE guidelines. But yes. In, Practical purposes, since she had some evidence of urge incontinence also, there is nothing wrong in having a baseline urodynamics before proceeding for any interventions. Okay? Yes, 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 Mr. Uh, any... I, mean, yes. Uh, I, I This was probably the next step in the discussion, so I couldn't reach there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, that's fine. what I always feel that I am a bit... No, this uh, I is can't fine. read the um, I, I intervention thing. No, no, no. The, this is fine. I, I don't think... Uh, I mean, if somebody is not reaching, say, tapes and uh, surgical complications and follow-up, the examiners will certainly look at, is it because of a fault in progression? Is it because of a slowness in the communication? Is it because of uh, lack of information in the communication? Okay, but but uh, you have a good flow, good communication, and filled with information. So it's not your fault, isn't it? So um, no way you can reach any further without cutting down any vital information. Yeah. 
what happens in exam is uh, in the first three minutes the examiners will know that okay you have got stuff and uh, they will try to help you okay. to proceed further that's why i didn't gave you a bladder diary and ask you to read i uh, didn't brought in eurodynamics uh, i was quite happy with the initial stages i didn't ask much questions what is the relation between decaf drinks and uh, urinary symptoms so we have really gone through there is no point in asking you what is the relation of the vaginal delivery and weight of the baby with uh, stress urinary incontinence symptoms because i know you are going to answer so that's why we have skipped a lot of questions and tried to progress and um, right. so once you finish number one the best thing is in the exam do not think about the scenarios which you have finished right. and right. even right. if it comes to your mind as long as you are confident that you flow is well your communication is well and you are quite in detail by not reaching the end it's not a catastrophe it, it will not decrease your point uh, maybe right. instead of yeah. eight you will get 7.5 and it doesn't going to matter you yeah. will not know the marks once you pass <laughs> So, okay. so it doesn't matter okay even if you right. get a gold medal you won't know the marks anyway right. Right. i, I right. hope i strongly believe one of our group students should get gold medal you all work very hard and um, uh, wishing you all the best always let's go for the next scenario uh, so uh, uh, just during this scenario yeah so we have stopped uh, the, i have a little bit confusion uh, because uh, the regarding this mid urethral tapes uh, so it is absolutely stopped now or because according to mhra that you can still do and uh, it should be reported on to the uh, uh, national database and if there is any complication it should be dealt in the higher special center that's my feeling but yeah. it, uh, or it yeah. is completely banned now yeah the best answer is uh, in my practice, we have the, the, I'm telling you the answer. Okay, in my <laughs> practice, I we have stopped using the midurethral synthetic tapes, but uh, whether it's autologous fascia or burst corpus suppression is still possible. I am aware that there are some tertiary centers which have license to perform the midurethral synthetic tapes with appropriate audit and uh, performance review. Okay. Okay. Yeah, still, that, it mean in the in the higher centers, it is still doing. Yes, yes, there are there are centers which are licensed and they are still doing it, but it's very okay. rare. Uh, you will find quite difficult, and uh, um, there will be a long consent process. And uh, it's better to say that in my practice, we don't do synthetic tapes. Don't say just medial tapes because you can still yeah. do the autologous facial medial slings. Mm. It's only the synthetic tapes are banned. Um, again, uh, one more feedback is it's not because of the quality issues, um, as mentioned, it's, it's more of like a um, artificial tape related side effects like erosion and long term pelvic pain consequences. Quality issue wise, people were well trained, they maintained the quality, but it's the inherent disadvantage of a synthetic tape. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, there was some study or some Montgomery or something review or some verdict. I, I am not sure what was that on this. Yeah, there, there are some reviews. In fact, Scotland has released uh, many guidelines on that. Scotland is the first one to release in 2017, 18, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the England followed that. Yeah, okay. Right, thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Sorry, I'm delaying it. One just a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we are doing urodynamics for stress, then should we uh, tell video and labels uh, classification? Does it help guide it or should we just say uh, urodynamics? Because I, anyways, yeah. we are usually just doing corpus suspension. Yeah, what I will say is um, as per the NICE guidelines, there is no role for urodynamics in a pure stress urinary incontinence. Please say this word so that your okay. the examiner is completely aware that you are aware of the nice guidelines and then you can say but in our practice we tend to do the baseline urodynamics because it will give us an idea about uh, the status of sphincter and uh, multiple interventions and it will be very useful especially if the primary intervention is failing and we need to go for some repeat interventions and uh, if available video urodynamics is better because it will clearly demonstrate the leak and it's very useful sometimes the leak is so minimal uh, you can demonstrate only with video aerodynamics and it's difficult to okay. uh, exam by examination it's difficult to ascertain right. okay? okay good can we go for the next scenario yes thank you okay your time starts now mm -hmm. 
you are uh, going to perform uh, urodynamic on a patient with spinal cord injury and uh, he had the injury at the level of uh, uh, C7 spine it's a motorcycle injury and uh, what precautions you will take before doing urodynamics so for him, my concerns will be uh, autonomic dysreflexia because it is above the level of T6, the injury. So uh, first of all, I'll make sure that there is no active infection going on. And um, uh, we will make sure that his rectal ampulla is uh, clear and clean of any uh, stools. And uh, I'll, I'll do a, a baseline uh, blood, pr blood pressure measurement. Uh, during the procedure, uh, I'll make sure that he's comfortable and if he develops any uh, symptoms like any headache or bradycardia or sweating, uh, I I'll stop the procedure then and there. Uh, also, if uh, the blood pressure measurement goes above 20 millimeter mercury systolic blood pressure, then also I'll stop the procedure. Uh, uh, and the next step will be to give him uh, nifedipine 10 milligrams of dingle. Or, and also release any tight bandages, sit, uh, make him sit upright and uh, make sure that uh, the bladder, bladder is empty. So these are the precautions I will uh, specifically use for this patient, apart from the other, other precautions like making sure that there is no infection um, uh, for a standard urodynamic procedure. Okay. Um, why autonomic dysreflexia happens? Um, uh, it is uh, it is because of any stimulus that can uh, happen uh, like any noxious stimulus or uh, or specifically for urology like in a bladder filling during a uh, urodynamics or even cystoscopy during the bladder filling the stimulus can the uh, the stimulus can pass through the uh, spinal cord above the level of the injury this will be sensed by the brain and there are two types of response by the brain either the i mean uh, one is a vagal ve ve response and the other one is a sympathetic response um, the vagal, uh, vagal response will be uh, shown as bradycardia. The sympathetic response will be uh, uh, more like profuse sweating uh, and vasodilatation, flushing. But unfortunately, because of the spinal cord injury, the sympathetic uh, response cannot travel uh, beyond the uh, spinal cord injury level. So the uh, part of the body above the spinal cord injury level will show all the features of uh, uh, brain's response. However, the, the below the uh, part of the body below that will, will not show any response. So uh, that will in, uh, result in increase in the blood pressure and that will go on to uh, life-threatening increase in blood pressure. And it is recorded, it is in the literature, it says that it can go up to a level of 200 and can cause dire consequences like convulsions, death and stroke. Okay, so in this patient, say for example, you have prepared him well, no signs of any infection, you have given him some laxatives to avoid constipation, and uh, you are arranging the urodynamics. What features or findings you are expecting in urodynamics in a patient with C7 spinal cord injury? For a C7 spinal cord injury, uh, there will be bladder overactivity. Uh, uh, the bladder will be less compliant and there will be detrusor sphincter dysynergia. Okay, what is detrusor sphincter dysynergia? So it is the uh, involuntary uh, un uncoordinated contraction of the uh, detrusor muscle and the external sphincter uh, because the coordination of the detrusor contractility and the external sphincter contraction is by the pontine micturation center. So once there is a uh, injury uh, in the spinal cord, uh, like in a infrapontine suprasacral injury, uh, the influence of pontine micturition center is gone. So that's why uh, DESD, the tussar external sphincter dysynergia happens. Okay, explain the nervous supply for the bladder and lower urinary tract syndrome. So bladder has mainly three types of uh, uh, main supp um, uh, blood uh, nerve supply. One is a parasympathetic, uh, sympathetic, and the uh, sensory nerve supply. The para, uh, uh, the uh, sympathetic nerve supply is from T11 to L2. It comes through the hypogastric plexus and is mainly mediated by the beta-3 receptors. Uh, the uh, parasympathetic supply comes from the S2, 3, uh, S2, S3, S4 segments, and it comes through the pelvic plexus and is mainly mediated by the uh, mascarnic receptors. The most common receptors are M2, but the effect is mainly mediated by M3 receptor. The sensory nerve supplies through the pudendal nerve, again through S2, 
uh, S3, S4 uh, segments, but through the ONF nucleus. And it supplies both the external sphincter uh, and uh, the pelvic floor muscle. And there are other receptors that can get upregulated during uh, inflammatory conditions, uh, like uh, P2X receptors and vanilloid receptors. The afferents uh, goes through the A delta and C receptors. Mostly A delta uh, is uh, for the stretching, stretch response of the bladder, and C fibers are recruited in, in painful bladder conditions. Okay, so can you summarize what urodynamic findings you'll be expecting in the C7 spinal injury patient and how are you going to treat him? So uh, it will be a low capacity, uh, non-compliant, uh, bladder with uh, uh, neurogenic detrusor overactivity, most possibly neurogenic detrusor overactivity incontinence, uh, as well as detrusor sphincter dysinergia. So how are you going to treat him? Uh, the the um, initial treatment we can try is um, uh, conservative management with a, a, a continuous, uh, sorry, clean uh, self-intermittent catheterization uh, using anticholinergics and uh, reviewing uh, the bloods frequently, uh, I mean the blood and ultrasound scan of the upper tracts to make sure that uh, it, it, this is responding. The threshold for a repeat with urodynamics to make sure that the pressures are normal uh, will be low for, the, for any neurogenic uh, patient, any neuropathic patient. If these uh, conservative measures are uh, not uh, improving the symptoms, then uh, intra uh, detrusor Botox injection uh, is the next option. Um, if the Botox injection is also not working, then the, we have to give the patient the other options, uh, like uh, the, the recycle neuromodulation, even though it is not completely licensed for a neuropathic overactive bladder. Uh, but uh, there are uh, studies in the literature which shows that it, it can be offered uh, for uh, neuropaths. Uh, the other options could be to uh, uh, option to increase the uh, bladder capacity like uh, uh, cystoplasty um, and uh, there are other methods that we use but not use nowadays like SARS and rhizotomies. Okay, uh, if you are planning um, cystoplasty for him, how are you going to convince him? He is not happy with Botox. So how will you explain the pros and cons and uh, get the consent? So I'll tell the patient and that uh, the aim of the procedure is to increase the bladder capacity by using a uh, by uh, by valving the bladder and using a patch of ileum so that the bladder capacity will increase the pressure of the bladder will decrease uh, that can uh, protect the upper tracts and also because the capacity increases his co continence will improve and uh, uh, his quality of life will be improved uh, i'll i'll tell uh, tell him that the uh, benefit of the procedure are following the principles of uh, uh, the neuropathic bladder like protecting of upper tracts um, maintaining the uh, continence um, and uh, improving the quality of life at the same time managing the um, uh, uh, urinary incontinence and uh, the risks involved are the early late and anesthetic risks involved uh, especially in a spinal cord injury patient the early complications in the, of the, there could be in, uh, need for blood transfusion uh, if there is any inadvertent uh, vascular injury and and um, uh, incidence of PE, DVT, um, uh, even uh, incident, uh, risk of uh, autonomic dysreflexia during the procedure and uh, other complications like wound infection, need for uh, drain, need for hospital stay. Uh, late complications include um, Main, the main concerns are uh, um, met metabolic complications like hyperchloremic metabolic uh, acidosis and uh, the mu recurrent mucus formation that can cause uh, blockage of the uh, um, uh, uh, cystoplasty and uh, spontaneous uh, bladder perforation, uh, peritonitis, uh, risk of bladder stone formation, um, recurrent hematuria, recurrent UTI, um, and uh, the so this this will be the uh, con, I mean uh, risks involved, and I also him I uh, also give him the Bowes information leaflet on ileus cystoplasty. What is the mechanism behind the electrolyte imbalances? 
it is because of the ammonium chloride that comes with the urine uh, because there is a ideal patch it is absorptive uh, the bubble lining is absorptive compared to a transition lining of the bladder the ammonium chloride will be absorbed into the into the system but that, that's causing hyperchloremia and disintegration of ammonium will release hydrogen ion that can cause acidosis okay very good we'll stop there uh, again as usual very good nice detailed discussion i really want to complete the full details on autonomic dysreflexia and also take you through the treatment path of uh, c7 spinal cord injury patient um, i don't think i have any major or minor concerns um, uh, any questions you have um, yeah, I had to uh, practice a bit more on the highly sister plus the things are not coming straight away, but uh, it was straightforward. Uh, one thing uh, regarding the uh, timing of um, video aerodynamics, because in OIB, we do it only after the failure of conservative management, isn't it? Yeah, in, um, in spinal cord injury patient, you can do because you can do early because any way patient will need one way or another. And uh, most of the spinal cord injury patients, by the time they are referred to a tertiary unit, they will have uh, a baseline aerodynamics done in the primary center. You can bring in that you will involve a dedicated spinal cord injury center in the treatment protocol because the outcome will be good if it is done in a high volume center compared to um, a district general hospital or any other center without the expertise in that. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, I will say video dynamics in the early stage. And uh, one other thing you can bring in is since there is a high chances of autonomic dysreflexia, or if the patient had previous autonomic dyslexia, you will coordinate with the anesthetic team and uh, make sure that the team is available. And uh, you will need anyway non-invasive blood pressure and pulse oximeter uh, measurement. And uh, sometimes uh, we have even conducted it in uh, daycare theaters so that uh, we have enough uh, support of the emergency equipments and anesthetic assessment if needed. So you can bring those things in. Thank you. Uh, one more question it is unrelated to this scenario, but if this happens like in a pediatric uh, viva setting, like for example, in a myelomeningocele baby, uh, will we, uh, what is the timing of the urodynamics in uh, uh, children? Because in uh, because I read in Campbell, like it is it can be given at started at three months, but during the discussions, um, uh, some some there was a discussion like it, we had to wait until patient is potty trained. So uh, I felt a bit of controversy there. Is there any consensus for that? Yeah. For, for example, if you are doing urodynamics with anesthesia, which is commonly performed in children, where we are more looking at uh, bladder filling, detrusor pressure, detrusor overactivity, and what is happening in the more of the filling stage, we are not much bothered about the voiding phase. There is no difference whether the child is potty trained or not. The child potty train comes into play only if you want to look into the voiding phase of the euro of the eurodynamics because for that the child should be conscious and uh, potty trained to control and uh, void on command. So if you are looking at mainly the filling phase to make sure what is the safe bladder, uh, etc., uh, I think um, potty training doesn't really matter. That's great. Thanks so much. That's clear now. Thank you. Good. And one other thing which I think you have missed is constipation. Uh, you yeah. mentioned about urinary infections, so make sure that patient is not constipated and it's always nice to give a uh, kind of stool softeners uh, empirically and also before the procedure with consciousness you need to do a parietal examination to make sure that uh, the rectum is not loaded. These patients with spinal cord can have loaded rectum and uh, with autonomic dysreflexia even the loaded rectum with a digital rectal examination can stimulate everything. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Good. Happy for the next scenario? Yeah. Okay, your time starts now. You have a 58-year-old gentleman presents with history of urinary incontinence. He gives past history of abdominal perineal resection two years back and he relates his incontinence symptoms uh, mostly due to that uh, APR surgery. How are you going to evaluate? Hello? Yeah. 
So I will see this uh, gentleman in my uh, functional urology uh, neurology clinic along with the incontinence nurse and uh, along with the bladder diary, uh, flow rates and PVR uh, urine dipsticks and I see IQ short form uh, questionnaire and I will evaluate his uh, uh, lots uh, if he has any lots and also the type of incontinence whether it is urge mixed or uh, uh, stress and then what's the quality of life on his uh, impact on his quality of life then as it is he has a history of uh, apr two years ago but i will also uh, evaluate further if he has any uh, any radiotherapy any uh, history of diabetes or um, uh, taking uh, any medication for that, uh, then what uh, is a bowel and sexual history. And then I will let, uh, make a note of some medication and move on to examination. My examination will be the uh, focus abdominal, see the scars, uh, palpate the bladder kidney, and then the neurology and the focal genital examination include the clinic genitalia and the DRE and DRE I will make a note of uh, prostate size, uh, anal tone, and then I will proceed to a neurology examination. And uh, then uh, I will uh, art for the investigations. Okay. My investigations will be the urine dip, uh, ultrasound scan theory and post wider and uh, giving history of his uh, APR section, my uh, high impression that he has a <coughs> injury to his uh, hypogastric uh, plexus giving the uh, injury uh, the the, uh, the injury to the nerve plexus i will organize the urodynamic uh, video urodynamic studies okay um, he had abdominal perineal resection for the bowel cancer he doesn't require any radiotherapy oncology wise he had a successful outcome and um, he had a kind of uh, bowel reconstruction and he is now passing feces normally. He had good control of the feces. And uh, what neurological examination findings you may be expecting in this gentleman? So neurological examination, he has an injury to the hypogastric, uh, inferior hypogastric plexus and to the uh, pudendal nerve. And then my, I'm thinking about the, is a, uh, is a low compliance, uh, high co uh, low compliance, a contractile bladder, which is the damage to the is a, a nerve to his external sphincter and to the bladder injury. Okay, uh, any motor functions in the lower limbs? Anything you will be expecting? Yeah, and I'm I'm also expecting the loss of L four five, which is the knee jerk, and then also the loss of sensation on the outer aspect of his legs. Okay, what uh, urodynamics findings you'll be expecting in this gentleman? The urodynamic findings will be the uh, is a, is a uh, low compliance uh, bladder with a good uh, uh, capacity mm -hmm. and leak and stress leaks okay. due to the loss of external sphincter tone. Okay, so what parameters you will measure during the filling and voiding phase of urodynamics? Uh, my, my parameters will be the, uh, I will make a good uh, quality of uh, urodynamic by making the cuff and then I will see what is the uh, uh, bladder capacity, uh, what is the compliance and at what time he leaks and what at what uh, volume he has a, a, a urge and strong urge to pass the urine okay uh, what do you mean by bladder contractility index the bladder contractility index to see the uh, strength of the detrusor muscles and it is done by the p dot at q max plus 5 q max so how and it, if, yeah if it is uh, more than uh, usually it is uh, more than 100 and if it is uh, less than 100 it is a hypocontractor bladder between 100 and 150, it is equivocal, and more than 100 and 150, it is a good strong bladder contraction. What do you expect in this patient? Uh, in this patient, I will expect a low contractor bladder. Okay. 
So how do you how will you calculate bladder outlet obstruction index? The the B bladder outlet is it is the P dot at Q max plus two uh, uh, P dot at Q max uh, minus two Q max. Okay. And if it is uh, less than twenty, it is uh, unobstructed between uh, twenty to forty. It is equivocal, and below for above forty, it is uh, obstructed. So what do you expect in this patient? Uh, in this uh, expecting, I'm uh, uh, expecting if you if we vocal or less than uh, twenty or less than twenty, yeah, okay, twenty. Okay, good. So is urodynamic shows uh, there is no signs of any obstruction with uh, very poor contractility and bladder contractility index is only sixty, and uh, there is no signs of any leakage. So how are you going to treat him now? So my treatment options will be to make him continent uh, and uh, because it is a safe bladder, so um, it I will ask him to carry on the pelvic floor muscle exercise. Long wind that uh, I will uh, 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 ask my urology continence nurse to teach him uh, intermittent self catheterization. So what is the regimen for intermittent self catheterization? Uh, if the regimen is that uh, it it should be if the PVR is more than hundred, it should be we start started and then uh, the patient goes to the toilet and after that uh, he wipes uh, he, he he do the self catheterization until the PVR is less than hundred, and then I will review him again after two to three months three months time. Okay, what are all the long term complications this patient may face? The long term complications he may face that uh, due to he may be incontinent or uh, wetter, or he can get a UTIs or he can get the stones. Okay, what is the role for continuous bladder drainage by suprapelvic catheter or urethral catheter? What are all the advantages and disadvantages of this? Uh, in this case, uh, because if he is a quite young person, and if I put a uh, suprapubic catheter, which is the best option in that case, he doesn't want, uh, and uh, or the other is a urethral catheter, but the super, uh, urethral catheter is uh, give a uh, urethral uh, hypospadiasis and difficult to manage nursing wise, but uh, sup and also it has a risk of uh, in UTIs in fact and uh, UTIs uh, bladder stones and uh, uh, contracted bladder and loss of uh, bladder compliance given the short pesty bladder same is the spc catheter but in that case uh, the, there's no usual hypospadiasis and it is better to do the nursing wise capacity and uh, yeah how will you classify the spinal cord related bladder problems the spinal cord bladder plated uh, bladder they are depending on the level of the spinal cord injuries in the in the like in the uh, it depends on the uh, it is a uh, from the uh, supra spinal uh, 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 and and uh, like uh, what in the hypothalamus super uh, so you cannot pronounce this name uh, but in the in hypothalamus in, in higher centers it is the uh, uh, the the it is the a neurogenic bladder, which is a uh, uh, overactive with a safe, uh, with oversector with a normal sphincter tone, and with the uh, suprasacral nerve uh, spinal cord injury, it is a detuser sphincter uh, dysmenorrhea, giving the, uh, the the overactive sphincter with the overactive bladder, and then in the, uh, in the infrasacral injury, it is the uh, Depending a uh, low uh, low contractile bladder, depending on the tone of the sphincter. If it is a tone is a normal, it will be the dry. If the tone is reduced, it will be the wetter. Okay, so you divide the spinal cord related causes into suprapontine, infrapontine. Supra sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Suprapontine, infrapontine, suprasacral, or infrasacral yeah. causes. So, what are all the other? Okay, we'll stop that. The question what I thought of asking is what are all the other examples for infrasacral causes? So for infrasacral it could be like diabetes, cauda equine syndrome, yeah, hereditary yeah, yeah. motor sensory neuropathy yeah. or pelvic fracture and trauma. The reason yeah. what we discussed is pelvic surgery. For yeah. suprapontine the causes are traumatic brain injury, 
stroke, vascular events like cerebrovascular accident, degenerative neurological conditions like Parkinson's, uh, multiple system atrophy, Alzheimer's disease, hydrocephalus, cerebral palsy, yeah. and neoplasms, brain cancers. Yeah. Infrapontine suprasacral causes, you can say traumatic spinal cord injury, which we covered in the last scenario. Vascular events like AV malformation, spinal cord infarction, demyelination disease like multiple sclerosis or transverse myelitis, again neoplasms, hereditary spastic paraparesis, tropical spastic paraparesis or spina bifida. So you can divide into three groups with uh, respective changes in the bladder, sphincter and about the coordination. Yeah. When I make the YouTube video, you will be seeing a quite detailed description of whatever we are discussing. And uh, since it's a mock exam, I can't show you the answers and uh, I'm just trying to make you blind so that you come out with your own answers. Uh, went well, very good. Um, maybe a slight increase in speed will bring more answers and increase yeah. the marks here and there, not only for this table, for all the tables. Yeah. Uh, any questions you have in overall all the three scenarios? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, they are to cleared by tape. Uh, this one. Good, good. The Thank scenarios you. are a little bit not very commonly we are seeing, like uh, BPH or stones. So it's uh, nice to present frequently and also get an overall understanding so that you, you will talk just like any other table like prostate cancer or stones table. Okay. Yeah, it's a little more practice actually. Yeah. Good. Um, any others have any questions before we complete today's session? Uh, no, it was clear, uh, but these sessions are really helpful for the preparation of exams. So. Um, uh, we'll be grateful if you can continue that till the exams. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Same, same here, Mr. Dhanashrikan. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So if I know what we're doing tomorrow, so it will be helpful yeah. for me. So we can good, good, good uh, preparation for tomorrow, please. Yeah. Sure, we will discuss that. Uh, I will conclude this session now and then we'll discuss that. So the, the aim is reading neuro urology by taking a neuro urology book or even uh, abraham's eurodynamics there is a new book released in abraham's eurodynamics just last month and that will give you a good idea but how to tailor that into the correct answers is the one which needs practice like this mock exam all three of you did very well very high quality discussions and i really dragged you to different corners to cover the whole syllabus so that you can use this as a good revision tool as usual, well done. We will call this class dismiss and uh, we will have as many a number of classes before your exams. Thank you for everyone.